Hello everyone, welcome to Sustainability Modeling for Spring 2014. Uh, this is uh, lecture number one and it's essentially an introduction to the course. Uh, let's uh, see what the contents of this lecture are. Um, I think I'll tell you a little bit about this class in more detail um, besides what you may have already know. Uh, we'll look at um, some sustainability concepts and a little history uh, behind the um, the whole concept of sustainability and uh, the reason uh, for modeling within the sustainability context. Um, so we'll do um, a little bit of understanding of, of why modeling and specifically why modeling sustainability uh, and we'll go through some initial examples. So let's start with um, talking a little bit about this class. Uh, the, the rationale for, for the class, um, why this new class uh, was started. I want to tell you a little bit about that. Um, we'll talk about the syllabus, uh, which you've already seen. Um, some of the class logistics, uh, being that this class is, um, is being taught for the first time in this format. Uh, some of the tools um, that we'll be using. Um, so let me tell you a little bit about the rationale. Uh, this class is essentially experimental in nature. Um, we this is the first time that the class has been taught is the first class first time that the class is being taught in this purely online format and in, in an open format um, the philosophy um, of this class is what i call the uh, modeling for non-modelers so it's really um, about bringing um, up participants in the class um, to modeling skills um, that are introductory uh, in nature, of course, um, but that will be sufficient uh, for uh, people to understand um, modeling and what models do and what models don't do in the context of sustainability. Uh, we use sustainability really as a means uh, and not an end. So this is not a class um, on sustainability, it's more, to be completely honest, it's more using sustainability as an excuse to teach modeling. So it's, um, and, and, and I think, um, you know, sustainability offers a lot of qualities um, um, because of the integrative nature uh, that, um, that make it a am amenable topic for modeling. So it's really, really about, um, it's, it's more a class about modeling and using sustainability issues uh, for modeling purposes, and and the I think the overall gist of it is that we, you know, I expect and we expect in in, in uh, that this could become a contribution to uh, the evolving field of sustainability science. I haven't seen any other modeling class uh, that has the scope of this class, and that's part of the reason why I created the the syllabus and the class itself and the topics. Uh, because I haven't seen out there um, a, uh, a class that really covers not only the topics, because the topics you will see them cover in, in more traditional sustainability classes, but from the modeling standpoint, I haven't seen anything like this. So actually, if you if you do see a class like this, I, I really like to know because I, I, I did a fair amount of research trying to find similar classes elsewhere uh, so as to not, to, not reinventing the wheel, uh, which um, we're pretty much going to be doing in this class. So... Hopefully, that'll give you a little bit of an understanding of what the class is about. Uh, let's move on to um, let's move on to the syllabus. Uh, the, the course synopsis that I um, that I put in I, and I, I hate these wordy slides, but I just wanted to capture some key words in the course synopsis that I offered in um, the course syllabus that was circulated earlier. Um, Really, this class is it's, uh, for students who are concerned with sustainability issues, okay? So that's, uh, it's, it's first and foremost, the, the, the first interest has to be on sustainability issues. You can, you can get a modeling class in other topics elsewhere. So this is going to be a modeling class on sustainability matters or issues. Um, and we're going to be honing in on understanding what modeling can do to help solve sustainability problems, okay? So modeling is going to be a tool to solve these problems. Um, we're going to be focusing very much on quantitative understanding. So it's this is really a class about crunching numbers um, and understanding what these numbers mean 
and understanding where these numbers come from and understanding the way these numbers are arrived at, how they may vary under different assumptions. Um, and um, a lot of the modeling is going to be directed at uh, designing, you know, policy measures. So it's, it's really, uh, you know, one nice feature of the way I've tried to design this class is that I want to go from 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 the model from the modeling and from the from the um, mathematics and number crunching to really cross the, the bridge to designing uh, policy measures that affect these sustainability issues. To do that, we're going to be using something that's um, been around for a few decades, um, at least in in in, in formal form. Um, which is system dynamics or system dynamics theory. Uh, and um, I, I'm, I'm going to be using tools that will allow you to uh, get hands-on knowledge of, of, these, um, of these tools and how they are used. Uh, so uh, my aim uh, with this class is that it's a class that's open to students of all backgrounds. Uh, so it's not for students that have a, a purely a scientific or natural science background or, or, or purely policy background or or purely modeling background. I, I think it's a, it's a class that has mass appeal and hopefully that that'll be the outcome. So um, let's see if we can get there this semester. It'll be very, very interesting. Um, let me um, move on to the learning objectives. Um, and um, yeah, these are also detailed in, in the syllabus, but I wanted to highlight um, and explain a little bit of what's, what's behind them. I, I think, um, you know, first and foremost, it's, um, it's about introducing students to, to key issues in sustainability, not isolate them and, and in of themselves, but actually how they interact with each other. So this is really uh, about uh, making, understanding these interactions and understanding them um, at, at different scales, um, and we'll look at issues that go from local to regional to global scales, and and um, you know different issues will 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 be uh, approached from from any of these scales. Uh, I think the next piece is that we're going to be analyzing these these interactions from again quantitatively. We're going to be focusing on, on really uh, on, on on number crunching quantities um, and uh, trying to understand what's behind these these numbers. Uh, we're going to be um, using models to handle um, interdisciplinary data. This is data that comes from different disciplines in sustainability and using system dynamics modeling as a as a, as a tool for this integration um, of data. Um, and um, I think uh, one piece that that um, hasn't been mentioned and I wanted to emphasize is also to understand the limitations of, of, of these models and these tools, not only um, because of assumptions that we make, but also because there's a lot of uncertainty in, in, uh, in the data and in, in, the, um, in the issues themselves. So I think, uh, again, um, we're going to be trying to quantify what this uncertainty is. At least, you know, it's, it's one thing to, don't, to know that you don't know something, but at least if you, if you if you don't know what it is, but you you do know that it's some within some uncertainty range, then you have a much better idea of how to how to handle it. And we're going to be, you know, looking at uh, at this with a series of examples in a series of topics. Okay, so that's sort of the um, you know the uh, the learning objectives, looking at the interaction, you know, quantitative, uh, interdisciplinary system dynamics modeling and uncertainty. Um, in the syllabus of the class, I've detailed the lecture topics that we will be covering. However, I wanted to briefly go through them just to give you sort of a preview of what we'll be doing uh, over the next few weeks. Uh, today's lecture, of course, is the introductory lecture as the one we're doing today. Um, next week, uh, we're going to talk uh, a little bit about modeling um, and uh, get into what that means uh, and also what that means in the context of, of this class and of sustainability issues. Um, and uh, that will be continued by actually using the, uh, the tools uh, that we're going to be employing to develop uh, these sustainability models. Um, then we're going to get into um, some of the sustainability issues. I think that the, the first one, which is incredibly important, is, is uh, population. And, and the population variable drives a lot of these sustainability issues because we're dealing with uh, with essentially um, sustaining uh, the you know the world population uh, you know with with uh, in, in, in interaction with other uh, with other things. Uh, so we'll talk about population, and we'll also 
uh, talk a little bit about uh, social interactions, which are interactions among people um, uh, that also drive a lot of the sustainability issues that we face uh, today. Uh, and um, I think the we're going to be start start bringing in after we talk about population. We're going to start bringing in uh, natural resources as um, as both means for sustainability, but also constraints for sustainability. And we'll look at that interaction between you know human nature in this sort of beauty and the beast context. Uh, and uh, of course, you know the we'll bring in. Uh, uh, the economy. This is not, of course, an economics hub, but certainly economic issues drive a lot of sustainability uh, matters. So we're going to be uh, looking at how the economy plays into sustainability issues. And um, and remember that we're going to be doing this all in the context of modeling for the most part. Uh, and then we're going to be bringing in further constraints, uh, you know, for example, uh, climate and climate change um, and uh, how that uh, poses a some constraints and some opportunities for sustainability. Um, uh, we're going to be looking at uh, specific natural resources, water being one of them. Um, we're also going to be talk talking about energy as, uh, as among other of the resources that will deal with sustainability. Um, um, we're going to see how, um, you know, water, energy, population, um, climate, uh, linked together uh, in, in issues like food production, which is a major sustainability issue of today, uh, biodiversity and conservation and ecosystems and how those play in sustainability, both being affected by it and also driving it. Um, um, then we're going to be revisiting um, uh, a, a well-known study that uh, was uh, you know, published in about 40 years ago, limits to growth, and, and we'll talk a little bit about that study today to sort of frame the discussion issue. Um, and um, then we're going to be looking, we're going to be slowly evolving, and you see this in the class, into uh, models of global sustainability or global sustainability models, and how do we how do we put this all together in, in this, uh, sort of the this full Monty uh, concept. One of the items that I'm sure you're very interested in is how this class will be graded. That's also detailed in the syllabus, but I wanted to uh, elaborate some on it. Uh, we'll grade the class through four basic mechanisms. Uh, there'll be a midterm exam, which is re not really an exam, uh, or it's, it's not an exam in the traditional sense. What I'll ask you to do, and we'll, I'll give you more details uh, for the assignment, is uh, to essentially uh, publish a, a blog post. And um, we'll publish uh, these posts uh, in, an, in an actual blog, and uh, you're going to pick the topic. Uh, I'm going to ask you to uh, to develop the blog. I'll give you some guidelines for it, and uh, you're going to be graded not only on the on the quality of, of the of the post, but also on the exchanges that you make with your fellow class participants and the comments that you make to the blog post of other participants. So you're going to be sort of uh, participating in each other's blogs. Each of you will write one, and each of you will comment and discuss on the other. So I'm going to be grading uh, that interaction. So that's going to be a piece, and we'll get, of course, to talk a little bit of more detail. It'll be an interesting experience. It's uh, You'll have a lot of fun, and I'm sure you'll learn a lot. Uh, then, um, then there'll be the more traditional term paper. This will be a piece of individual work. Uh, you'll focus on a sustainability topic of your choice um, and develop a... Uh, you know, a model for it, and I'll give you guidelines as well for that. Um, and um, there'll be a final exam, and I'm still thinking about how, what the format of that's going to be, uh, but there'll be a final exam <laughs> towards the end of the semester. We have some time to figure that out. Um, and then I'll, um, we will have a, a class Facebook page uh, that I detail at the end of the lecture, um, and uh, and there'll be a Facebook group that you'll, they'll ask you to join. And... Um, Facebook is a very good tool to sort of have the discussions, and we're going we're to be using that resource uh, not only to generate class discussion, but also uh, to post uh, class materials, to post, I mean, you'll be able to post additional materials if you come across an interesting reading, a piece of literature, uh, a video uh, that, yeah, that you feel like sharing, we'll use that. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be um, grading uh, your participation in the class through the Facebook uh, page and through the Facebook group um, that I detail at the end of the lecture. Now let's uh, get to, into the class logistics. Uh, 
These are also sort of detailed in the syllabus, but I wanted to expand some on it. Uh, first, uh, as you've probably uh, realized already, um, the lecture is going to be fully online. We won't have any in-class meetings. Uh, we may arrange from time to time a synchronous uh, online meeting. That means that we all meet at the same time, but we meet virtually. So, uh, But we're not going to be sitting in a class uh you know, sitting at a desk, me in front of you, you in front of me, in front of others. That's that's not the format of this class. Um, uh, lectures will be recorded and posted um, on Mondays or, or probably earlier uh, for viewing on the Facebook um, group page. And we will create, or I have created, a Dropbox folder for us to share files. So all class materials are going to be on the cloud, on Dropbox, all the time. Um, all the instructions for the assignments, um, all reading materials, um, every deadline is going to be uh, posted on Facebook as well as on our Dropbox folder. Uh, so, um, so you'll have uh, access to uh, the, the class videos and the course materials all the time, anywhere where you are, as, as long as you have access to, um, you know, Facebook and uh, and online and you, you're online um, uh, and um, which which you can do. And uh, we'll handle uh, class communications uh, for the most part uh, through, again, through the discussion threads in Facebook. Um, and uh, you, we can always have a one on one communications uh, and, uh, you know, have email, have phone. You can always, we can always uh, contact uh, that for individual consultations. But for class related <laughs> issues, um, I, want, um, I want this class a lot to be about sharing. Um, and that's why we're using social media to, to deliver the materials in this class. So that's essentially a gist of what the logistics are for, for, for conducting uh, the class. Um, approach, um, uh, let's talk now a little bit about uh, sustainability. And uh, it's, it's, you know, you've probably taken another class on sustainability. If you haven't, I thought it would be a good idea anyway to uh, try to define what sustainability is. And... Um, so sustainability is, um, and I picked up a few definitions that I found on dictionaries and on the web, the capacity to endure. Well, it's kind of a, a general definition, which is fine. Uh, not Probably not my favorite. Um, um, a more traditional one that I found was a method of harvesting or using a resource so that the resource is not depleted or permanently damaged, which starts getting at the at the relationship between using a resource and the the state of the resource uh, in in the future, okay, and and that's a little bit of what um, I want to talk about. Um, now, definition that I found: the quality of not being harmful to the environment or depleting natural resources, and thereby supporting long-term ecological balance. Again, um, you can start seeing you know a couple of emerging things here. One is the, the, the use of a resource, and second is it's the time, um, the time issue. You know how you know what are going to be the impacts of that use into the future. The definition I, I sort of continue to like the most is the definition that um, that was put forth by the United Nations in the uh, late '80s, um, which um, sounds something like uh, meeting the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. So. I think the, the the key items that need to be captured here is that there is a there is a relationship between uh, resource use in the present, resource use in the future, and satisfying needs in the present and in the future. If, and, and the balance of all that is what um, it's it's this concept, this elusive concept that we that we refer to as sustainability. So it's not a static it's not a static concept, but it's a concept that has that has evolved over time and they will continue to evolve over time, okay? Um, so I want to do a little bit of history and um, I, I want to um, look at the work um, that I consider to be the sort of the, the first attempt to, to formally uh, pose the questions of whether um, humanity, our world, our lives uh, were sustainable. Um, in a in in a more or less quantitative fashion, so I, I, I it's it's um, it's not just about posing the question. Uh, that's uh, that tends to be uh, posing questions, um, and uh, in, in in the context has has been done. But 
Uh, posing questions and, 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 and trying to answer them in a quantitative way has not been done that frequently, particularly not in sustainability. And uh, so uh, the first of those works was the, was the work of, of Thomas, of the Reverend Thomas Malthus, and we'll talk a little bit about that, of a Malthusian analysis. Um, we'll look at the uh, historically what followed that um, in the uh, agricultural agrarian revolution uh, that took that you know, took place, and I'll talk, tell you a little bit about that, and we'll look also at that a little bit more detail later on when we discuss food production. Um, the, um, the issue of the, of the tragedy of the commons, which um, was a, a piece of seminal work that, uh, that came about that really tackled um, uh, the, the, the notion of the use of a common resource um, and, and the different approaches that can that I can take, uh, and that was a, a very interesting um, a piece of work that was published in the late 1960s, based on and you know some historical data that had been gathered for a couple of centuries. Um, then we'll talk uh, a little bit about uh, this um, the study in the 1970s that, uh, that that it would be probably what I would call the, the first attempt to look at sustainability from a modeling standpoint, so not not just quantitatively like Malthus did, but actually, you know, using computational models and, and system dynamics uh, tools. Um, and this was the, the Limits to Growth study uh, that was um, uh, published in the, in the 1970s. Um, and then we'll move on just to introduce some of the, you know, what I call the today issues, you know, when, and we talked a little bit about these in the syllabus, water, food, energy, and the economy. So let's move on to um, to the study of um, the work of Thomas Malthus. Um, and uh, uh, Thomas Malthus was was a reverend who, um, um, in um, 18th century, well, late 18th century, beginning of 19th century, England um, uh, published a series of works uh, that became known um, uh, for uh, for his concerns about population growth and, and sustainability. So I I would say that this is perhaps uh, the first uh, work to tackle what we know as sustainability today, and and I think that's that's fairly accurate uh, to say this. Um, he authored um, the essay on the principle of population, and there were six editions of this uh, report uh, or or this essay that were published between 1798 and 1826, um, and um, and Malthus sent Malthus central issue was um, the unequal nature of a food supply to population growth or our ability to produce food uh, to feed the population as it was growing. Um, and, um, you know, this, of course, centered in what we would call today um, the exponential or, or, or geometric growth versus the linear or ar arithmetic growth and of um, and uh, if, you, if, you, if you think about it very simply, um, and um, let's uh, take a look at a, a um, you know, a couple of graphs. Um, you know, the first graph uh, just um, uh, sort of shows what exponential growth looks like versus linear growth. And exponential growth, essentially, it's, uh, it's growth that is multiplied or that is dependent on the number of population that's present. So let's say, you know, very, very simply, um, you know, if for the very beginning, uh, there was one person, this person, uh, or actually there should be two people so they can reproduce. Um, uh, so, um, you know, they, they have, uh, a number, you know, number of, of, of children, let's say they have two children. Um, so the first generation produces two, but each of these two, um, uh, is able to produce two more. And then what you, what you start having is that you have, um, a, um, a, an accelerated growth curve, which is the blue curve there on the left, um, that's, um, that's referred to as, uh, as exponential, and that is referred to population. Um, Malthus argued that food production was at best going to be able to follow uh, a linear growth model, meaning that it will, um, it's essentially, if you know technology in food production would allow food to grow, over time, um, such that in you know um, the amount of food produced per year would increase uh, by by a constant amount. Okay, so that was that was Malthus' assumption, 
and that's uh you know what's called linear food production or, or li linear uh, growth uh, for food so Malta's concern was that essentially uh, we're going to be running this into a situation where um, the even even if uh, like the growth you know the, if you look at the curve on the right even if the linear curve is it's for time it's higher than the the, in the exponential uh, curve of population at some point um, the population growth was going to overtake um, our ability to produce food and you know and we would crash so that was the that was essentially the concern um, and uh, now this concern today we understand that was driven by that the assumption that um, food production would you know would would follow this linear growth uh, model um, and um, it was interesting and and, and I, it was published in 1798 and, and I have here a little picture of, of the of cover page of the original study but you can actually see the whole study in, in, in some of these links uh, the first two links cover you know the entire um, you know the entire uh, essay. Um, the, the the third link there that I encourage you to see is um, a nice uh, summary of, of the history uh, and what you know how how that study by Malthus was actually you know taken up by the by the you know how it was criticized and what happened with it over time. So now, needless to say, um, you know. Malthusian analysis and Malth you know, the Malthusian predicament um, um, was sort of, you know, it, it had a high impact when it happened, you know, in the, in the beginning of the, the 19th century. But then um, the, uh, this agricultural revolution sort of came about. And um, what started happening is that there were changes um, introduced uh, around the world in the 18th and 19th century that allowed agriculture and food production to grow at, at a much faster rate that, that Malthus had predicted. So um, this created sort of a backlash um, towards uh, this, the Malthusian um, predictions, the Malthusian judgments that, you know, that uh, population was going to overtake food production and we were all going to die, that the, the world had no future. And um, and uh, we start living in a, in a, in a uh, for a couple of centuries, start living in ages where that saw a lot of progress. Um, and um, a, a big part of that progress was in food production and, and, and this agricultural revolution. The changes that were, the, were introduced were, you know, anything from new crops uh, to uh, rotation of crops. So you could use the same piece of land and, 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 um, and, and, cr and have several harvests of several crops during the year so as to keep production going it was not just uh, you know um, a bimodal in which you would grow part of the year and then and then the, the rest of the year not um, the introduction of new and improved breeds of um, um, you know of, um, of uh, crops um, infrastructure um, you know better better buildings to store and to uh, and to conserve um, um, uh, food um, uh, drainage purposes, better ways to to have irrigation, uh, more in efficient irrigation, so that uh, uh, the per land per land unit production of crops could grow. Um, um, the use of fertilizers, new implements um, became you know became new um, you know um, became new ways to accelerate food production. Um, so this had backlash on the whole Malth Malthusian um, uh, theory that was based on. Essentially, uh, the fact that food production had was was tapped out, you know, or the rate of food production was tapped out. This demonstrated this agricultural revolution demonstrated that, um, you know, essentially innovation and improvements could really turn things around and uh, ameliorated that concern of population. Um, and uh, and this actually revolution, uh, you know, w went well into the 20th century, um, you know, and. Especially in the 1960s, um, there was a, a, a sort of the, another big expansion with uh, you know high yield varieties of, of cereals and and um, more irrigation, better irrigation infrastructure, better management, um, uh, synthetic fertilizers. So the chemical industry uh, took off and um, and really um, um, uh, created uh, this um, powerful um, uh, powerful growth. Of food production that really uh, uh, threw 
the predictions that Malthus had made at the beginning of the 19th century completely away because, you know, there were about 100, you know, 150, 160 years went by where uh, the world saw a, a, a really large growth uh, in the food production um, and completely quelch uh, these concerns um, of competition with population growth. So, um, so that sort of went away and, and um, I, I think what, ha what, you know, what happened as a result is that population growth really took off exponentially. And, and if you look at that population growth curve, the exponential, you can see that as, as time progresses, the slope starts getting, you know, steeper and steeper. So we really started growing as population very, very fast. So this gets us into the 1970s or thereabouts, or the, you know, sort of the, the 60s and 70s, when we started looking again at the data and saying, yes, population is growing very fast, and yes, food is also, food production has also, you know, grown fast. Um, and we're, we're going back into a situation where we should start thinking about um, how to balance these two. Um, and it was interesting that for... Um, over 200 years of history, uh, sustainability was was the competition between population growth and food production. And, and you know, and and, and um, we can, we'll see today, and we'll, we'll start seeing in this class that there are a whole, whole whole host of other issues that that are involved. Um, now, this late 60s to the to the uh, tragedy of of the commons and. Um, you know, this is a study that that, that um, this pu was published in um, in 1968 um, uh, by um, a um, I, I, let's see the the, the the classical paper by by Harding um, in 1968. But actually, the studies were was conducted or or the the this work focused on um, on villages in England. Um, before 1750, and um, in those days, uh, these villages had uh, large nearby areas that belonged to the village. Okay, um, and um, these common areas were were not held in any sort of private ownership, but m members of the village could raise their sheep on their land, and also um, and often released uh, their their extra sheep to the commons. And the idea was that um, you know. I'll feed the sheep with my resources, but there's a common pool also that I can I can use, and there's really no no one stopping me from doing it. Um, so these users reasoned that even if their animals on the commons did not grow well um, because of overconsumption of the grass, any growth was a benefit that would have not otherwise have materialized. So whatever happened outside in the commons was extra. So. Um, so, but what happened is that if if everybody starts doing that and everybody starts consuming from the commons um, in an uncontrolled and uncoordinated way, then the, the outcome of that, and that's what uh, Harding shows in his paper, is that um, essentially this results in, in, in the collapse of the commons and essentially the death of all the sheep. So it's, uh, it's what it's called the tragedy of, of the commons. And, and it's, um, it was an interesting um, study because it, it, it gave some theoretical basis to the approach of use of resources by individuals um, in different ways, um, in in a sort of an individualistic way, um, you know, every every person on its own, or in a collective way in which, and, and this started putting some um, some theoretical meat on on um, on the on on the science of sustainability, so to speak. So I, I would say that, you know, in addition to the work by Malthus, then this tragedy of the commons work was an, a second major piece. And it took up, you know, like I said, it took a couple hundred years um, to get from one to the other, almost uh, 170 years actually, to get from one to the other. Now, now there's, a, there's a nice video that I encourage you to see, um, um, and I'll let you watch that on your own, I'll, I'll, I'll post this video as well on our YouTube page that so has has a very nice explanation of, of the issue of the tragedy of the commons that I encourage you to see. And we're going to come back as well uh, to this when we discuss economics and social behavior and how we model that. Okay. Um, the the next piece um, 
of, of, of work has to do, it, it was very, very uh, short, shortly thereafter um, from the tragedy of the Commons work and it was the, the, the Limits to Growth uh, publication. And um, this was a study that was commissioned by the Club of Rome, which is an international think tank that, that was founded in, in the 60s and it's still in existence today. Um, and um, it, it was really the first study of its kind um, in that it attempted to computationally simulate global sustainability issues. So to me, this is the, the Limits to Growth study of, of 1972, the first edition, became the, uh, this was essentially, um, you know, 40 years ago, um, it became, it, it became the first attempt to try to simulate what would happen in the world under different scenarios of growth, okay? Um, and um, to use this, uh, um, the researchers developed uh, a, um, a model um, that was referred to as the World 3. I, I have never quite found out whether there was ever a World 1 or 2. <laughs> Um, but, you know, all I know is that there's, uh, there's model world three that actually still exists. And I'll tell you a little bit about it today. Um, the study became quite controversial because, um, I think, unfortunately, uh, and this is just my opinion. I, I, I think it, it focused more on the policy implications. Um, so, uh, only the outside of the study got a look. Okay. So, um, so I, I think people sort of read um, you know, how I, you know, what I like to say, you know, people went straight to the conclusions of the report, read only those couple of pages, and then um, never really stopped to understand what was behind it. And I, I think that there was a lot, that the most valuable uh, piece of work, and the reason that the limits to growth, in my opinion, you know, uh, has had such an impact, and and probably the reason that that no other study to date has had that same impact is, is because of of what was inside the, the methods that were used and, and the, the potential um, uh, for it. And, and and much of the um, much of, of what we'll be learning in this class has its roots in in, in, in the science that was developed for this limits to growth study. Um, now, interestingly, um, and and we'll see that in in, in this class in in, in in a few lectures time. It's this study was followed by by uh, what was referred to as a 30-year update. So the the same scientists sort of got together in 2000 or near, uh, thereabouts and looked at well. So we predicted 30 years ago this was going to happen. What has actually happened, and then and try to see what you know what was right and what was wrong and why, etc. And actually, it turned out that uh, a lot of the trends that were identified were were right on the money. And we'll we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, so. I, I want to talk um, briefly some more about the World 3 model because it's it's really a uh, it's the kind of tool um, that we're going to be um, looking at. We're not going to be uh, simulating the whole world. Uh, you know, we'll we're, we're, we'll we'll probably tackle uh, some more specific issues, but uh, the science that's there um, it, it's uh, really the kind of uh, the kind of approach. Um, that um, that we'll be using, you know, um, with uh, with the corresponding updates that have taken place over you know the past four years, but this model um, essentially used um, a, a a set of, of of five quantitative variables to um, understand what was happening in the world and what would likely happen in the world under under you know different scenarios and. The first variable is is population. Okay, so these are quantitative variables. So these are these are um, variables that um, uh, can be quantified and can be used to understand the state of the world. So population of the world is is one key variable that tells us where the world is. Capital is another variable. This is the sort of the amount of of, of capital. This has to do not just with money but also with infrastructure. Uh, services and, and um, the amount of, of capital that exists in the world. Food, okay, again, we uh, we go back to food production as one of the key variables um, uh, that drive sustainability. Um, the state of non-renewable resources, okay, uh, and, uh, and how use of these resources uh, 
to um, to live and to produce capital and to generate food um, and to grow population is used, and um, and then you know a side effect of of, of growth which is pollution and, and, and the, the the limit to growth uh, study the world three model had um, sort of a pollution variable in there to account for the fact that that uh, population growth and capital growth and food production and, and resource depletion led to uh, a um, a measure of uh, degradation of the surrounding environment, which was referred to as pollution. So those were the five um, variables that were um, that were used in this study. Okay. So let me show you just um, let me just show you a um, um, typically what uh, the output of this model looks like. And and um, I hope the curves are clear, but you can see in in, in the graph there are, there are five curves. Um, and there's a time horizon between 1900 and 2100. So what they did um, was that they looked at what had happened in the world between 1900 and 1970, which is where they cut off uh, the data um, um, to develop the models. And then they looked at what would happen between 1970 and the next 130 years until 2100. Okay, um, and they have these five variables, and and, and you can see here um, essentially uh, how each of these variables um, uh, behaves, and I, I and I just have some snippets as to um, you know how um, how these variables um, behave. First, the first one is that um, the, the limited resource pool is exhausted, so you can see that resources curve drops um, between abundance in, in 1900 or that that was the starting the starting resource pool. In 1900, and then in you know in 200 years, uh, you essentially consume all resources. Um, you can see that um, that food production grows um, essentially at the beginning due to resource availability. So there's resource available, there's technology, so you can you know you can you can use water and you can use energy to produce food. Um, but at, after these resources start um, being depleted, then the ability to produce food decreases, and that's sort of the sort of the collapsing part of, of the of the system that they that this study shares with the work of Malthus. Um, population also can grow because of, of resource and the food availability. So there's resources, there's pr food production, so people can grow. But of course, when resources start running out and food production starts um, uh, slowing down, then you know population also. Um, you know, starts decreasing. And industrial pollution and, and, and sorry, industrial output and pollution pretty much follow the same trend. There's a, um, um, you know, while there's resources and there's population, uh, you know, industrial output, this capital will, will grow, there'll be more machines, there'll be more production of, of other things. Um, and But that generates pollution. Um, and, um, and, um, and both of those grow, of course, as Again, because the resource pool is being shut down and the resources go essentially decrease to a point where there's pretty much not available anymore, um, you know, eventually capital output and pollution itself, um, you know, die away. Uh, there's a little bit of a lag on pollution because the, the underlying assumption here is that um, pollution probably, you know, takes some time to develop or at least to be noticed. Uh, um, in, in the system. So that's the, you know, the overall gist of it. Um, so this is the kind of thing, the kind of, um, of analysis that um, this World 3 model allowed to do. It allowed to look at these five variables in an interlocking relationship with each other. So these variables don't be, you know, don't operate independently. They are very much interactive with each other. And how the collective of the five of them would evolve in a period of 200 years. Okay, so that was the that was the value um, that um, that I see in this study. Unfortunately, as I said, I think people focused more on the on the sort of the 2100 result and saying, oh, so you're saying we're all going to die, that food's going to go away, population is going to go away. So um, and uh, so that's sort of the the um, it's like 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 Malthus. It's sort of this credited or, or, or people didn't pay too much attention to it. But there's a lot of value in, 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 in how 
and tying you know these variables together and, and seeing how um, how they interacted. Um, the nice thing about about models and um, the world three is no exception is is that it allows us it allows us to look at uh, you know what if scenarios you know what if we started with a with a world that had twice we had twice as many resources as we have now so um, you know what would that do and and essentially um, um, so let let's say an, an, an example is you know what you know like like it has happened what if we discover more oil reserves or we have better ways to access groundwater and uh, and minerals. Okay, so um, so there's more resources, and in this in this particular simulation um, of the model, uh, there were twice as the base simulation that was presented before. So more resources, and essentially what happens is that um, the the resource availability actually delays the decreasing limb of population. So it's still you know, even if you have twice as many resources, and, and that's that's what the, the model simulated, even if you have twice as many resources, um, you, you, you end up in a situation where uh, resources are going to be depleted. Of course, they get depleted later on, so there's a delay. Um, but nonetheless, if there's a delay in resource availability, there'll be also a decrease in associated um, uh, population, uh, food, and industrial output. Okay, so it's sort of the same finding. It's just that it happens later because you have more resources. Um, it's like you know having, you know having more money in your bank account and then you know losing your job. You're going to be able to sort of live off longer, but eventually, if you don't find a job, the situation won't be sustainable. So that's a little bit of the same same assumption. Um, and um, now, in this particular case, resources are, are not wiped out completely. You can see actually that at the end, the resource pool sort of picks up, um, but it's um, it is severely depleted compared to its initial ab abundance. Um, and um, um, so, this scenario, twice as many resources, indicates that you're still headed for an unsustainable um, output or outcome, um, but it just happens later. Okay, so that's sort of the the um, you know, the, the five second version of it. So, well, then they push the envelope even further. So what happens if we have a world with unlimited resources? This means that resources um, are, are there. You have a, have a, a, a vast pool, okay? Um, and um, in this case, uh, you essentially, um, you have sort of infinite resources, but they're still consumed. So you're still consuming them. Um, and um, now what happens if you have infinite resources is that you start, it, it, it's, this is where the trade-off comes in. Um, if you have infinite resources, you're able to produce a lot more food. You're able to produce a lot more industrial capital, industrial output. Population is able to grow more, but then pollution takes off. So you, you generate enormous amounts of pollution. Um, and then that, um, in, in turn, um, um, affects because it increases the, the, the death rate of population. So if there's more, pollu more pollution, the assumption is that more pollution will affect population growth because it will increase the risk of death of population. People will get sick um, um, because the, you know, the water is polluted, the air is polluted. Um, so, uh, so population actually is indeed affected by it. Um, and, um, and look at the uh, at the industrial output and and uh, and food production towards the end, where they really start increasing. I want to I want to ask you to think about that and 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 answer why you know why that happens. I, I want you to comment on on the uh, on the on the, on the group page on, on that on that question. Okay, it's a you got to think a little bit about this dynamics, but I want to more intuitively um, try to make you think about this. Okay. Well, then they looked at, at you know at a whole variety of scenarios. So they had um, a um, a world uh, with unlimited resources but pollution control. So this is a, a a world where the resource pool was very large and there were pollution controls. So pollution can, could not go above certain value. So there was some maybe a technology or some in technological innovation that would allow um, uh, for um, um, for pollution to be kept in check. Um, so essentially the outcome of this is that the population grows more, uh, the food availability 
become scarcer because you know now you have population growing uncontrollably because there's nothing to impede it there's plenty of resources there's plenty of food because you can produce it um, and uh, but as population starts growing um, it will overtake uh, food production capability um, and um, and then you know as you consume these resources uh, then it becomes harder to produce industrial capital output um, and um, um, and uh, eventually things go down you know and pollution eventually I mean it, it will the the fact that it's controlled doesn't mean it doesn't happen it, it will occur but it'll, it'll just be occur much slower um, and um, and then there's another scenario at, at the right um, uh, which is the same, you know, unlimited resources, pollution controls, but then uh, increased agricultural productivity. So this is the scenario in which you're able to produce more food with the same resources, okay? Um, and uh, it just, um, it essentially uh, sort of exacerbates these trends. Uh, so it's sort of the same, um, a little bit of the same output, it's just that it's um, um, a little bit more accentuated, the, these trends. So um, what happens if you have unlimited resources, pollution controls, and now you have uh, birth control. So you, you have a way to control population by regulating uh, the, birth, the birth rate of population. Okay? That's the scenario on the left. And the scenario on the right um, is the same, but it has the increased agricultural productivity, so more, more food production. Um, so the outcome of this is that uh, because population is controlled, um, Food production and industrial output per person grow very fast, but then pollution also. It's even if you, even if you have it controlled, it, it will it will grow, uh, because you're 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 generating more food, you're generating more output. Industrial activity generates pollution, um, and um, and essentially all this growth of of food production and industrial production uh, drive down resource availability. Okay, so essentially resources are, are depleted in both cases. Um, and then, you know, the nice thing is that you can start looking at all these different scenarios. Um, and uh, uh, these two, um, I think, are a little bit unrealistic because uh, these are scenarios in which, um, uh, in, in which you have what's called a stabilized population. So this is a situation where, um, uh, by some magical <laughs> rule, you're able to say, okay, so we'll, we'll, we'll go up, we'll, we will grow world population to this level and stop, okay? Um, but it's it's useful to just look at the outcomes, and you know the outcomes of this. It's that the um, the pollution is kept in check, um, you know, uh, because um, the growth is limited, um, and but the abil ability to produce food is is limited by by resources, um, and um, so that's another you know that's another um, um, you know another outcome of this. Um, and both are pretty much the same. Um, then they looked at what's called a, a sta stabilized uh, world model, and um, and um, again, stabilization is brought up about by controlling population, which I think is completely unrealistic. Um, and um, now, industrial output and food production are kept efficient over time, um, and um, and independent of resources and and, and better technologies. Uh, so that's the um, you know that's you know that's um, a a piece of it. Um, now, by depleting um, less resources, then pollution is kept in check. But again, uh, these are sort of unrealistic uh, scenarios. And I, and I think, in retrospect, um, considering these scenarios, um, I, I think subtracted a little bit of credibility to the study. Um, and I, I would have, uh, I probably would have, even if I included, maybe I would include just one for, for the sakes of showing, but nothing else. Unfortunately, they went into a stabilized world model too, um, and um, in, in this model, they um, it's characterized by introducing birth control and better technologies for food and industrial production in, in 1975 on, on the left um, simulation and 2000 in the right side simulation. Um, and the outcomes of this is that pollution is kept in check um, and resource depletion is curbed, um, and um, but this 25-year delay in, in policy implementation, which is what they wanted to show, is the delay of implementing these policies, uh, delay stabilization. So I think that that was the you know the um, and those were the major scenarios run in, in the World Three model. So um, let's shift gears a little bit and, and talk about um, 
you know, the kinds of things, the kinds of topics that that um, we're going to be discussing. And I, I want to start. I wanted to start the the um, the intuitive intuitive um, introduction of system dynamics by by using some very simple uh, examples uh, initially. Um, and uh, I'll talk about your bank account, your or my bank account, your personal bank account. I'll talk about your body weight. Um, um, I'll talk about population growth, so we'll look at, at, at more of a collective uh, variable. I'll talk about water in a lake uh, and the global economy. Okay, so let's try to try to tackle these issues. Let's look at the bank, at your bank account, and and um, and your bank account. Essentially, if you if you uh, think about um, what you look quantitative for in your bank account, it's essentially uh, the amount of money that's stored in your bank account. Okay. Now that amount of money in your bank account is not a static variable. It's a variable that, that changes over time. It changes over time because um, you have inputs of of uh, of money, um, and they, those may come uh, through income or deposits into your account. But you also have um, outputs, and th these can be expenses, investments, uh, any you know any other any other um, money that comes out. And then internally within the account, you have um, essentially uh, also inputs and outputs um, that are that are dependent on the amount of money that's there. Um, and and I, I want to make the distinction because um, and we'll we'll make this more clear later on about inputs and outputs that are dependent on the variable itself and those that are not. And um, and uh, for the most part. Um, um, you know your income and, and your deposits um, uh, may be, for the most part, may be independent. Uh, you know, your salary it's not really dependent on the amount of money you have in your bank account. Um, but if you look at other sort of you know like interest and, and fees and charges, um, uh, there are there are, there are add or subtract from bank account. Those might be dependent on the amount of money that you have. Now, if you add all these things up, you know what you have in there plus what comes out in minus what comes out, then you have an idea of how that bank account quantity variable is changing over time. Okay, so so I want to keep that that notion um, um, in you know in in, um, in terms of this is their, this particular example. Um, another another simple one is is your body and in in the body weight is also another quantitative variable that you keep track of and, and that is your the body mass or, or your weight okay now your body weight again not a static variable it will have um it be influenced by inputs you know like food um and outputs like you know ex excretions or you know surgery i don't know if you i don't know do a liposuction or something or you know whatever it is um a little bit classic crass example but there also will be these um um, you know, within, um, you know, inputs and outputs that are dependent on your body mass, uh, you know, like your exercise or your diet, you know, you know, um, um, you and I, um, have different body weights. And if you, if you go out there and run four miles, if I go out there and run four miles, the outputs are not going to be the same just because, um, it is a, it, it, that, that output is going to be dependent on, uh, you know the specific body mass, and, and uh, I'm simplifying things a little bit, but you get the idea. Again, um, another system where you have a quantitative variable that's affected by inputs and outputs, and thus it varies over time. Okay. Next one, a little bit less individual, is population growth. So let's say you're looking at um, at a city, a country, a state, or you know, and and you your variable is the number of people. Okay. Well, number of people is, is, is not, or not, the population in, in city, state, country, uh, whatever entity, it's not a static variable. It will be affected by, by inflows, and uh, the inflows could be net migration, positive or negative. Um, it could be net, a, a net migration into, into the location or out of the location. Um, and um, uh, the output of that, or or the um, um, is, is, is deaths um, that are are related to um, 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 you know anything that has to do with with accidents or or just people dying naturally, and, and then there's of course uh, the um, the births and deaths uh, that occur naturally within the system. Okay, 
Um, so again, the balance of, of these inputs and outputs will give you the dynamic changes in, um, in population. Okay? And we're going to be looking at these in, in a fair amount of detail uh, in this class, but I wanted to sort of plant in, in your brains uh, the, sort of the logic of this. Okay? This, this sort of uh, adding inputs and outputs and, and trying to see how those change over time. If you look at water in a lake, it's the it's the same the same reasoning. Um, the quantity you're likely to look for is the volume of water in that lake, um, and that's affected by inputs. And primarily, those are going to be rainfall. There might be other inputs as well, and there'll be outputs like you know infiltration through the ground. There'll be runoff discharges to rivers or to the ocean from the lake, um, and um, and then there'll be you know, primarily an output that depends on the amount of water in the lake, and that's evaporation. So the evaporation depends on the amount of water in the lake. So if, if I want to keep track of this, if this quantitative variable of, of water in the lake, I need to look at all these inputs and outputs and see how they shake up. Okay. Let's look at agricultural production, another one. Uh, so... Um, so in this case, the quantitative variable should be, you know, be the agricultural products, and this could be, you know, um, tons of, of corn or tons of um, of wheat that are produced or, or that are uh, that um, that are present, uh, you know, in a farm or in a in a state. Again, it, it depends on, on on the on the system, and and there'll be inputs, um, um, inputs such as land and fertilizers or outputs. Um, which, which is the amount of food that's generated, that's uh, produced, and it's uh, it's driven, it's it's sold to the markets, or or it's distributed to to some to some uh, supply chain. And then there's um you know the um, the decay of the loss, uh, you know uh, um, you know a fraction of, of the crops are lost to to you know naturally to weather issues or to uh, um, um, you know to decay natural decay. So again. Um, the the balance uh, of these inputs and outputs will tell you a little bit about how agricultural production will evolve over time. Want to move into something bigger and better? Let's look at the global economy. Um, well, I sort of put this in there, but I was just kidding. We're really not ready for this one just yet. Uh, so let's not get ahead of ourselves. And there's a useful lesson here. So we need to start small and start by looking at small systems. You know your body weight, your bank account, you know population of a, of a you know small system, and see how that changes before understand those before um, we move on to understanding larger systems. Okay, so let's just not get ahead of ourselves. I th threw it in there just to generate a reaction. Now, of course, you can you can pretty much appreciate that these systems are are not independent. So if you look at the you know, at water and energy and other issues, they're they're connected. And, and um, so, if you have, um, you know, let's take the population system that we just looked at, and and we looked at the water in the lake, other system we looked at, and and we can think of uh, these two systems interacting. Uh, so, for example, um, you know, uh, the volume of water, the availability of that water, the water feeds the population. Um, it's it will have an impact on 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 the health of 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 um, of the people, which will affect uh, births and deaths. So if you have good quality water, plenty available, uh, you have you have capability of having more births. But if you have little water available, or poor quality, then then you have um, you know you have more potential for death. So there's a connection between these two systems th through health. There could be another connection. Number you know the number of people affect evaporation through essentially development you know more people the more people the more roads the more infrastructure you need the uh, that affects that you know decreases the evaporation the natural evaporation of, of, of the of the system and uh, you know you sort of alter the cycle the cycling of water okay so you generate a uh, a, a a balance there um, and um, you know um, other events such as um, you know excessive runoff, uh, you know natural disasters or flood can can affect um, you know have an impact on on creating additional deaths in the system that will affect population. So you can see how these systems become connected, and it's they're not really independent or completely independent of each other. And and part of our job in this class is to find 
not only what these connections are, but how we quantify them. Okay, so we're going to be looking at these, um, and we can actually do you know connect more systems. Let's say we let's take the two systems that are connected now, and then look at at the another subsystem that we looked at the agricultural production, and we can say well you know. Um, uh, the availability of water uh, through either infiltration or runoff um, will affect the land availability. For, so for example, if you flood a piece of land, it, will, it won't be available for, for harvest of, 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 of a crop and, and you, know, you sort of affect agricultural production. Um, the amount of food uh, feeds directly into the number of people that can be supported. Uh, so that's another connection between these systems. Um, and um, um, the variety uh, or the ability of agricultural production to grow may affect, may attract or detract uh, migration, um, and uh, that's a you know that's a common problem in in many countries um, uh, where um, mass migration, you know, mass migrant workers um, 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 move move between one country and the next, or one one city and the next to work on, on the fields and agriculture. So it's a big it's a big uh, a big interaction that happens uh, worldwide. So. Um, so you can see that how you know how these systems start connecting, how um, the influences, the mutual interactions, and these mutual influences are are not trivial to to predict up hand. And this is um, this is one of the reasons why we need modeling. Um, and um, so my pitch for why do we need modeling? You know, first of all, we need to be quantitative, um, and um, in order to design effective policies we need to understand quantitatively what's going on um, um, we need to be able to forecast even if even if we're wrong and and, and more forecasts are wrong um, um, the ability to forecast does point you in the direction of a trend that that might enable you to 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 launch a policy or to implement a policy or to make decisions and they are important um, I think another another key use um, uh, of modeling is assimilating data. So uh, there is data that's collected, and and, um, and models allow you to use that data to essentially analyze it and extract results. And um, and um, you know anything from the simplest, uh, you know, like a linear regression, which is a which is a tool that most of you might be familiarized with. It's it, that's a model in itself, um, and models are really thinking aids okay i i um in this class for the most part we're not going to be um looking to models as as um you know as predictors but more as thinking aids and, and one piece of advice that I, that I give you now is that it's, it's 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 it is best to never use the word prediction when you refer to a model because you're going to be wrong no matter what um but actually, models are not really intended, or at least the models we're going to be discussing here, are not intended to predict. They're intended more to help us think, to analyze data, to to um, to forecast. And forecast um, has a big, um, you know, big uncertainty to it that we'll discuss. And and uh, and uh, and models give us the ability to be quantitative, but not really to predict. So I want to I want to I want to um, sort of take that word out of the vocabulary in this class right now um, as, as, a, as a piece of advice, okay? Now, for this class, we're going to be using a piece of software um, that's, that's called Vensim. Um, and um, I've already asked you to, to download it and install it, and we'll, we'll spend a couple of sessions um, learning how to use it and, 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 and using it to set up our our models um, but it's a um, you know the gist of it is that it's a tool that's easy to use to in, in, in assembling and running system dynamics um, models and, and and as well as analyzing the simulation results okay now um, it's not the only piece of software is available but it has my opinion it has a very simple interface that, that's easy easy to learn very quickly, um, and it's also free of charge for classroom use, and that's a big criteria right there. So I'm not going to deny that. And and um, you can you can look at some background uh, on the tool itself here uh, for some history and background of, of the tool, and we're going to be um, uh, you know looking at that more closely. So we're getting to the end of of, of this lecture, and so uh, I want to look ahead. 
what we're going to be doing next. Um, next, we're going to be formally introducing the, the discipline of system dynamics modeling. So we're going to be, you know, looking at this modeling um, um, uh, concept from, from a little bit more, more formally and, and more, more accurately. Um, we're going to uh, uh, explain the purposes of modeling, so a little bit more detail of what we explained today, and, and um, we're going to work on understanding the components of a system dynamics model, um, and um, gradually building a, a system dynamics model. So we're going to be looking at these systems that we've described, water, you know, food, um, you know, uh, energy, uh, population, and we're going to gradually start building simple system dynamics models and then more complex. Um, so hopefully this would allow us to get a grasp not only on the modeling technique itself, but also as to how integrating these pieces through modeling will shed some light on on, on the questions of sustainability, which we'll, we will be posing continuously. So that is pretty much it. Um, I am going to, like I said, I'm going to upload, um, um, well, actually, if you've seen this, I've already uploaded it, but um, 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 this lecture will be uploaded. It will be there on the Dropbox folder in our Facebook page uh, for you to see and, and uh, you to look at. Yeah, you can go back and forth. Um, and uh, you can ask any questions on the discussion forum. So it's been a pleasure. And I'll talk to you next time. Uh, thanks very much. Au revoir. Enjoy the rest of the week. And here are some closing items for today's lecture. Uh, first, um, as I mentioned, there's a class uh, Facebook page, which is really a Facebook group. Um, the nice thing about Facebook groups is that uh, we actually don't have to be uh, Facebook friends uh, to share materials. Uh, so we can have the group and we can not be friends. And I think that's uh, sort of a nice boundary because, uh, you know, um, uh, I don't need to see your pictures on Facebook and you certainly don't want to see mine. So, um, uh, but the Facebook group will allow us to exchange material. So uh, that's and that, and the, the link uh, to um, address uh, the, the Facebook group is there. Um, there's also a class a Dropbox folder in which I will post all class material. So today's Lecture materials uh, are there, and you can go that link. Uh, make sure you can access it. And uh, this leads to a, uh, uh, an, 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 the assignment for this, uh, for this class. Um, I want you to join uh, the class uh, Facebook group and to access the Dropbox folder. And I want you to report back that you were able to do so. And please uh, don't call me, don't email me, post it on Facebook to make sure uh, you're there. Uh, so, um, so that's it, folks. Um, have, uh, have a great week. Enjoy the lecture, uh, and again, if you have questions, have comments, have anything to share, go uh, to our Dropbox uh, and Facebook uh, folders and uh, put them there, okay? Take care, guys.